All right, guys, here we go with Unit 2, Lecture Number 2. We are going over other countries. Now, we talked about the Spanish coming over to America and basically killing off most of the Native Americans, whether through slavery, warfare, or disease. And the French and Spanish now are all coming over. Other European countries, England, everyone's looking to come over to the New World to get rich quick. So the Spanish, they're using that as an example. Everybody wants to get as rich as possible all as quick as they can. And the Spanish came over first, at least colonized first, got a ton of gold. The other countries now are looking for that. So you have the French coming over first. They're looking for this. It's called the Northwest Passage, which is a way they, they believe at the time is a quicker way to get to China. They have no idea or they haven't mapped out North America yet. So they believe that if you came across the Atlantic Ocean, you would get to China quickly. So everybody in Europe, not just the French, but everybody else in Europe, all these other countries colonizing, are looking for this quicker way or shortcut to China. When in reality, it, there's no such thing as a Northwest Passage. They just don't understand that Canada and America are up there and that somebody has to map it out. So the first two French explorers that come to the New World are Jacques Cartier, he comes over on the St. Lawrence River in Canada, and you have another member of the French area called, or the French, you know, country called Samuel de Champlain, and you know him today from having Lake Champlain named after him. He's hired by the French fur company, so he's actually hired by a company, not the French king, to come and colonize the New World. And because he's hired by the fur companies, his job will be for the French set up fur trading and trapping colonies. So his job is when he comes over, he establishes a place called Quebec, which is the only, still today, French-speaking area of Canada. And it is the first permanent French settlement. And if you look, 24 people total, 24 people on a boat show up to Quebec, and only eight survive the first winter due to being cold, everything else from sickness, disease. They're just, they're not ready for this bad weather, especially in Canada where it's cold, and everything else goes on. So they're not ready for this survival. So in, in order to compare it to, the Spanish came over and wiped out through warfare or disease. The French, in order to survive, need to learn the Algonquin, which is an Indian tribe, and Huron, another Indian tribe, their languages and customs to survive. So these two groups work together. The Indians actually, pictured down on the bottom, the Indians actually help the French survive and actually become sort of like friends because the French aren't trying to change them, whereas the Spanish were colonizing and forcing them into religion, forcing them into slavery. The French are just working with them to trade for fur. So New France is the new territory in Canada and down into the Americas, and they're there to make fur, or there to trade and trap fur, which makes them money just like gold for the Spanish. They're using the rivers, the river systems of North America, for their travel, and the they're going to be friends with the Native Americans. The French and Natives are going to be friends. Everybody will get along. Uh, the French go on hearing about this great river. The Indians talk about a great river, this giant, enormous river. And the French, thinking that it's the Northwest Passage, send a trader, a fur trapper, and a priest. Here's their pictures down here. Their names are Louis Jolet and Father Jacques Marquette. We know Marquette after where Dwayne Wade went to, and we don't like him. So those two guys go down the river. They travel about 1,000 miles and actually stop going down the river. They don't find the end, and they assume it's not the Northwest Passage. So the king sends, the French king, King Louis, sends a new man, Robert de La Salle, who, again, has a college named after him. And he's, his job is to go on this river, the Mississippi, and figure out where it lets out to. Where does the river go? So de La Salle gets all the way to the bottom of the river, which empties out to the Gulf of Mexico. And when he gets to the Gulf of Mexico in New Orleans, Louisiana, he stakes claim for France, and he calls it Louisiana. He puts a flag in the ground. Here's this picture here. You see all the Indians sitting like a nice. They're crisscross applesaucing, sitting down, listening to the French say, hey, we have this land. It's our land, when in reality, the Indians didn't have land anyway. They shared the land. So there's New France. It goes from the Great Lakes down to New Louisiana. They have trading posts, Quebec, Detroit, St. Louis, and New Orleans, all French-sounding cities. Most of the people here in America for the French are fur trappers, which is a tough job to do. Most people didn't want to come over. It was too cold where they were located. They were afraid of Iroquois Indian attacks. These Indians were, in some cases, Mohawk Indians who were scalping people. So they hear stories about that, and they stop wanting to come over. And last, King Louis decides, hey, none of my people want to come to the New World and colonize, which doesn't make me money. So he starts giving away free land to his French nobles or friends, 
And when they come over to the New World, they're bringing forts, bringing other people, and more and more French people start to come over. It's still not a very popular place to go due to, you know, Iroquois attacks and everything else. Uh, moving on, you have the Dutch people, which is a country called the Netherlands. And the Dutch, trying to get rich quick again, send their first explorer, whose name is Henry Hudson. We know him from the area of New York with Hudson Bay. And he leads the Dutch in 1609, who comes out over to New York. They call it their first colony. is called Albany, New York, which is pictured on the bottom for you to look at. Again, they're looking to try to find the Northwest Passage. Albany is their trading post. Henry Hudson actually gets kicked out. The Dutch actually kick him out because he's unsuccessful in finding the Northwest Passage, where he later dies. The Dutch themselves, though, looking at this area of New York, found a new Amsterdam, which is an area right here. It's an island called Manhattan Island, which today we call New York City. In New Amsterdam, in order to keep the Indians away from their colony, they build a wall, which where that wall was located is actually today called Wall Street. And their name of their whole colony, which is pictured down here in yellow or gold, is New Netherland, named after their mother country. All right, the Swedish people come over. They're, of course, from Sweden. If you notice on the map, they are just below or to the south of New Netherland. They come over, again, north, looking for the Northwest Passage in gold. They're all now trading and trapping fur in the same area. You have the Swedes, the Dutch, and the French all in the same area, trapping and trading fur, which, of course, leads to fights, conflicts with the Indians involved as well. So now you have the Indians there as well as these three big major countries, all trading and trapping, which is going to lead to fighting and violence. All right, moving on. A big change in history comes when a man named Martin Luther down here. Martin Luther leads a reformation for the church, and what he does is he is, he is a Catholic monk, and you see him down here. He has written out 95 problems with the Church of England with the Roman Catholic Church that he doesn't that he actually works for and you learned about this last year in seventh grade so he breaks away from the Roman Catholic Church and creates his own called a Protestant or the Church of England or Anglican is what they call it they're called Lutherans today but Martin Luther's ideas are that the church isn't being fair and being the only church he thought that the church was taking advantage of parishioners people that would go there so his 95 problems he nails to the church where he works he breaks away He's protesting the church, which is why we call them Protestants. And now you have a big major church, the Roman Catholic Church, splitting off into little splinter cell groups almost, where Martin Luther is one of the leaders. So especially in England and Germany, where this is taking place, you have new little religions kind of battling over who runs all this new land. So besides the countries, you have religions kind of battling over colonization as well. Uh, the two major countries at the time are these two up at the top, Spain and England. Spain being the number one country in the world, whereas we are today. Back then, Spain was. They colonized. They have lots of money based on the gold they were taking. And you have England, who's an up-and-coming country. They've always been around as well. They've been fighting over the years. And you have this man who changes history. There's King Henry VIII. Uh, if you want something fun to do, look up how his wives accidentally die a lot. So if you go to Wikipedia or somewhere else to see his wives dying... So King Henry VIII needs to have a boy. He wants to have a boy in order to have a king in the future, but he has lots of girls and his wives accidentally die. His firstborn is right here. Her name's Queen Elizabeth. So as he's dying, his dying wish is to have a boy, but he doesn't. He has all daughters. So he asks for divorce for one or a divorce from one of his wives from the Pope, and the Pope doesn't grant him that divorce. So he actually breaks away from the church, the Roman Catholic Church, forms his own church, the Church of England, or Anglican. And it's basically the Roman Catholic Church plus divorce. So when he passes away, his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, she's not pale, she wears lots of makeup. But Queen Elizabeth takes over for him. So she is the world's most eligible bachelorette, much like the TV show. And you have the world's most eligible bachelor, the king of Spain, King Philip II. Those two kind of think in their heads, hey, look, you know, it's hard to find somebody being the king and queen. He's the world's richest man, and he's in charge of the largest country in America. He's the most eligible bachelor. He would probably be giving roses to all kinds of girls. You'd have the Queen of England, who's the most eligible bachelorette, looking for somebody to love too. So he believes, King Philip, that it would be a perfect thing, being Roman Catholic, to marry Queen Elizabeth and kind of merge the two countries. Spain would kind of take over England through marriage, and it would help the Pope. The Pope is all about this because Spain, which is Roman Catholic, would then kind of take over 
England's religion. So the Anglican church, the church that King Henry set up would actually go away and Queen Elizabeth and her people would translate or turn over into being Roman Catholic one more time. So he keeps asking her hand in marriage and of course she says no, which makes him sad. So every time he asks her to marry him, she keeps refusing. Now, in order to make things worse, and girls, come on, when boys ask you out and are annoying, you like to annoy them back and make it even worse, because you're evil. <coughs> so, what Queen Elizabeth does is she sends sea dogs, or pirates, she hires pirates, her best sailors, to steal the boats coming back from America, full of gold. Her pirates in England are actually taking the Spanish boats full of gold and bringing the gold back to England so that England starts making money. This is illegal to do, but one of the most important pirates at the time, his name is Sir Francis Drake, he actually gets knighted by the Queen for his achievements, which is actually pirating or stealing things, which is totally, totally illegal. But she supports this, almost to kind of push you know, King Philip's buttons even more and make him more mad. After a while, King Philip's had enough, and he sends his largest navy in the world, the Spanish Armada, which is 130 warships strong, to the English Channel, the area between England and Spain. And the English have a small navy, smaller boats, but it's basically a fight between school buses in the parking lot and Volkswagen Beetles. You have these school buses, which can't really maneuver around the parking lot, but are lined up. And then you have the Beetles that can kind of weave in and out of the bigger boats. So you have the big giant Spanish Armada that can't really move in this small area of water versus smaller boats that are more nimble and move, can move quicker. So after a few days of fighting, and this is a huge war, not just in the water, it's a war on land as well. But the Spanish Armada, after a few days, is sinking its own boats. The English are starting to sink theirs because they're more, more maneuverable. And after a few days, the English are winning this battle on the ocean. And the Spanish try to retreat and go back to Spain. And a huge hurricane or tropical storm hits the, hits the English Channel and wipes out the rest of the Armada, or most of them. So Spain goes from having the largest armada in the world to a really small navy in this one war. And what happens is that Spain, even though it's powerful and has lots of money, not having that navy to kind of bully people around hurts their image in the world. And now all of a sudden England, who's still really an up-and-coming country, they're not top in the world, but England's defeated the number one the number one country in the world. So England is looked at as now being a leader of the world and England's going to look at actually colonizing the new world now and sending people to colonize. So hope you enjoyed everything. This this little lecture is over. Hope everybody enjoyed it and I'll leave you with this fun sound. <laughs>